So we do, 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 so we don't have to feel, feel, feel. I believe that our greatest pain comes from the lies we tell ourselves. Slowing down, trusting, and surrendering is the clearest path to allowing the universe to show up for us. Hi, everybody, and welcome today to someone I've been a fan of for a long, long time, and I've wanted to meet for a long time. We have so many friends in, co in common, and this is the wonderful Gabby Bernstein, who is amazing. I can't believe you've been in this business for 15 years. You look like you must have been an embryo when you started, but um, Oprah Winfrey described Gabby as a new thought leader. She's in Oprah Winfrey's network. Super Soul 100. She's a New York Times bestseller. She's got a great new podcast called Dear Gabby. My first question to you is, you started at 25 and so many people in this business kind of wait until they're older. I guess they want to have a wealth of material behind them. I love the fact you started so young, but I'd love to know what made you start at 25 when most people are still finding themselves. What led you to do that? It's funny. I think I actually started when I was 14. <laughs> I was uh, uh, the president of the Jewish youth group in my region, in my community. And I would lead these, these weekend retreats for all like hundreds of Jewish kids in the temple. And I was sort of like this like 14 year old uh, spiritual teacher. So it was always in me to uh, be gathering and connecting around faith and spirituality beginning at that age of 14. When I was 20 to 25, I actually stumbled in the wrong direction and I began uh, really down the wrong road of addiction, cocaine addiction, and alcoholism. But I always had that stack of self-help books next to my bed. I had Dr. Dyer and I had Marianne Williamson and A Course in Miracles and Louise Hay and Shakti Gawain. And they were all just stacked up next to the bed because I was a seeker even in the midst of my addiction. By the grace of God, I was able to help myself get clean and sober, uh, make the commitment to get sober at 25, then entered into recovery rooms. And in my sober recovery, I was not only reintroduced to my faith and a faith of my own understanding, but I claimed it. I claimed it as the as the source of, uh, of, of, the, of the clearest path to recovery. I claimed it as the, the right choice, the right-minded way of perceiving my life and my next step and my next step. In my sober commitment, I became very spiritual and started to deepen my studies as a spiritual student. And very quickly, like you said, at 25 years old, I was on the stage with a microphone talking about spirituality, talking about my personal growth experiences, talking about my sobriety. And 16 years later, the rest is history. <laughs> That's what I've been up to. <laughs> such a great role model for women because up until I think about 10 years ago, there were really so few women speakers, maybe Louise Hay, but um, there really weren't enough. Well, most people in personal development were men, most psychiatrists were men, most therapists, I guess, were men. So it's really exciting that you've been here for so long and you're one of the forerunners of personal development. And I, one of your messages is that we should do less in order to manifest more. So could you talk about that? Why you believe that to be the case? Absolutely. I, I definitely did a lot of doing in the first decade of my career and life of, well, that, that stage of, of sobriety into the 10 years into my career. I, found that as soon as I started to unravel a lot of the uh, energetic disturbances and fear-based belief systems that had kept me kind of running and pushing and controlling, and I started to settle and I started to uh, allow myself to work from a more a grounded, centered state, I was doing a lot less and attracting a lot more. And what this means to me is that when we are in that manic state of trying to force something into being, we are actually blocking the natural order. We're blocking the power of the universe. We're blocking our ability to be receptive because this is what I call a manic manifester. When you're sort of pushing and controlling and trying to make stuff happen and trying to keep it on your timeline and your agenda, you're strangling the universe. You're strangling the natural order. 
And you're also in an energetic state that's very uh, frantic at times. And it, like I said, not receptive. Therefore, we aren't able to witness the intuitive source within us, or we're not able to listen to that inner guidance system and we block our manifesting power. So slowing down, trusting and surrendering is the clearest path to allowing the universe to show up for us. What would you say to some people? Because I see people who almost slow down too much. They're like, okay, I, I want to be a millionaire. So I'm just going to manifest. I'm going to sit on my couch and I'm going to manifest it. I, I want love. So I'm going to just sit in my chair and manifest the guy of my dreams. But they don't understand that you also have to take some action. You maybe have to go out somewhere where the guy of your dreams might be. Yeah. So, I hear what you're saying, that some people are so busy doing, doing, and looking, and searching, and, and the franticness is a block. But what about the other end of the scale where people say, hey, I, I read the secret, and all I have to do is sit at home and manifest. And I, I spoke to someone recently, and she's got this idea for a business. She said, yeah, but I believe if I have to work hard, the universe doesn't want me to have it. So I don't think I should do any work at all. And I was trying to say to her, look, you know, you, you have to do some work. I mean, she, no, no, um, I really believe if it's meant to be, all I have to do is think about it and it will be, and, and no effort is required. And I thought that was a little unusual. Needless to say, she hasn't actually made anything happen in this okay. <laughs> so far. But what do you say to people who do nothing and say, but, but I'm a manifester. I shouldn't have to work or go out or do anything except manifest. Well, there's two sides, as you're, as you're mentioning. There's the manic manifester. And then there's also the sort of apathetic person who's like, well, I can just meditate all day. That's actually not true. We have to be able to take action, but when we, but what I refer to, uh, and I have a whole method for taking action in a way that I refer to as spiritually aligned action. So you have to take action to, as the, we always use this word in the spiritual space, co-create the reality that you want to manifest. It's not like you can sit on your ass and meditate and think you're going to attract things into your life. It's not, that's not true. We have to show up for what we desire. We have to get on the dating app. We have to apply for the job. We have to write the book, but we can't do it from that frantic place because that frantic manic place will get in the way of the receptivity, but we also can't not do it. So the action that I refer to is spiritually aligned action, which means taking action towards your desired goals and dreams, but from a place that is faithful and surrendered. When we take action from that grounded, surrendered state, that's when we can really know that we are in the co-creation. We can know that we're, our agenda, our timeline, our controlling, our manic energy is out of the picture. Our desire, our inspiration, our joy is in the action and we can surrender it. We can, we can take the action and let it go. That's the power of the co-creation. When I, uh, whenever I've created anything in my life, it's not like it's funny, you know, I say do less and attract more, but I've also written nine books in 11 years. So it's not about not doing, it's about not spinning your wheels. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and interestingly, when you're taking spiritually aligned action, the actions don't feel like doing at all. They're extremely joyful. The action is, it feels like an extension of who you are. It feels like an extension of your authentic truth and it's an inspired action. And when you take action from a place of inspiration, you're fulfilling your true function, which is to be an expression of love, an expression of, of inspiration and an expression of spirit. So it's, it, it's beautiful that you saw both sides and that you brought that up because it, it, it's do less and attract more but that doesn't mean you don't do anything. <laughs> Absolutely, my daughter, my daughter's an artist and I was just helping her get a house. And we went to, we were looking at a lot of houses and I said, you know, these are all wrong. Actually, what you need is, you need an unmodernized house with a basement that you can turn into an art studio. So we kind of thought about that and lo and behold, that's exactly what we found. And she managed to buy that. But that was a great thing about, we had to look at a lot of houses every day. Here's another one. Some of them were not quite right. Some were almost right. But we were manifesting what she wanted, but she still had to go and look in order to find it, but she did. So that was a great thing. 
And there's something else you talk about a lot, which I really like, which is understanding what you can and can't control. I believe that there's very little that you can control apart from your thoughts. In fact, I think the only thing you can control are your thoughts. When you take control of your thoughts, that changes your life. But I'd love to hear your take on what we can and can't control, how to recognize the difference and your personal experience with surrendering and letting go of that desire to control every outcome. Well, to echo what you're saying as it relates to, we can control our thoughts. We can master the decision-making part of our thoughts. So we can decide to think through the lens of fear, or we can decide to think through the lens of love. This isn't for everyone. Of course, there are people with mental illness and that, and to say that's just a decision is very unfair. So I want to be very conscious of that, of that of biochemical conditions. But in the case of people who are not suffering with a mental illness, and and even if you are suffering with mental illness, illness which I have, you can still make a choice to, to seek solutions that, that, that often is still available. Just want to clarify that. But I I, I want to identify that to your point, we can't control anything that's outside of us. We can't control our future. We can't control our past. We can't control other people. We can't control what's going to happen with the weather. We can't control what's going to happen with COVID. We can't, we, we are powerless, <laughs> but where our true power lies is in our ability to lean towards the, the loving presence within us, the loving mindset within us. I am a student of IFS therapy, the self within us, the resourced adult part of who we are to be the leader, to be the voice that we choose to listen to. That comes with mental reconditioning, that comes with therapeutic practices, that comes with spiritual practice, that comes with, with a commitment to undo all of the belief systems that we've been taught to believe in is from children and from birth to the present and reclaim a more loving perspective of the world. And so when you show up with that, through seeing the world through the lens of love, seeing the world through the lens of that adult resourced part of yourself, that's when you can actually witness your experiences change. And I often say that we can't change our experiences but we can change our experience of our experiences. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, like, especially you can't change your friends, but you can change your friends. I love that. Yeah, you can change how you perceive them. You can yeah. decide, you know, that's actually an interesting point. This year with COVID, a lot of friendships got really rocked, right? And uh, personally, I can speak to that. And I decided, you know, I'm not gonna change these friends, but I'm gonna change the way I show up or the way that I, or maybe I see them a little differently. Maybe we have a different type of relationship. So it's, 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 uh, you can't change people, but you can change how you experience them. Yeah, I had, um, when I was in LA, I had two sets of friends. One is anti vaxxer the other is pro vax One is fanatically Trump and the other is fanatically Biden. And they both came to lunch and I was just sitting back observing how strange it was that they were each very keen to convert the other. And that was never going to happen. And that's like saying I'm, a Muslim and you're a Christian and I've got to make you change. But really you just have to be open to someone else's point of view. It doesn't have to be your point of view. I know when I was parenting my daughter, I'd meet parents that were really had these rigid sleep so then I sleep schedules. Then I had the um the co-parenting and they're all different. And all you can ever do is find your own way, especially as a parent. You have to find your way for your child. Do you believe in controlled crying? I personally don't. I, I would never do that, but I have to respect someone else's decision to do that and to have feeding schedules and sleep schedules. But my, I find the greatest parents were hippies because they were just so laid back. And I have Two friends are actually very successful court lawyers, but the whole attitude is hippie. They kids eat when they want, sleep when they want. And they're probably the best parents I've ever come across because they've totally given up any control. And they said, we have so much respect for our children. And so I'd love to ask you two things. One about your journey to be a parent, because I know you had a plan for when you'd be pregnant and that didn't quite work. Often it doesn't. It's like that saying, you know, if you want to have a laugh, tell God your plans. But I'd also love to hear your own take on how you parent. You have a little boy, don't you? 
Yep. I have a two and a half year old son called Oliver. Yeah. So that, that's fun when you decide I'm going to control it all here because with children, they're, they're just like little puppies. You, you really got, but I'd love to know what you learned as a parent. So first I'd love to hear the story of planning your pregnancies. Yeah, planning. <laughs> yeah, that word. That's a funny word when it comes Let's to talk about that first. Yeah, so you had a plan. I've re- I've written a lot about this journey. I've spoken about it on stage. To your point, when we when we have a plan, it, it's kind of a joke, and that was the case for me. It took me three years to conceive my son. The journey of conception really was, in retrospect, a journey of learning how to reparent myself before I could become a mother. It was also a journey of surrender because when you have such a strong desire and you think it has to happen on your timeline, all that creates is just a tremendous amount of resistance. So I had to really practice what I preach and surrender to what was of the highest good for myself, for my son, for all, for my husband. The, uh, I, I deliver, I, I delivered my son two and a half years ago. And I remember the day that I delivered him, I said to myself, wow, thank God this didn't happen a day sooner. The journey of, uh, surrendering completely to the experiences that I needed to heal before I could be a vessel to receive that baby was exactly as it needed to be. And I, and I, now, as I'm in the conception journey, sort of towards the next phase of it with a second child. I was able to go through that journey, a year of IVF and weight gain and going to the clinic in the middle of COVID and all of the things I had to do. I was on medication every single day for 365 days for this past baby. I really want to just testify to the fact that the work that I did, the spiritual work that I did to surrender my first child really showed up for me quite effortlessly in this next journey towards conception. I just was able to just show up with faith, trust that the universe has a plan, trust that the timing is better than mine, trust that my body is resilient, put positive energy into it, use your fertility meditations and and hypnosis, just continuously going back to the source of true power, which is the source of faith that I have that faith carried me this past year with a lot of failed cycles and, and, and whatever. And now I'm, I'm, I'm really seeing in retrospect how perfect it really is. So that is what I would refer to often as spiritual conditioning. When we really start to strengthen our faith muscle, we can go through the same experience again, very differently with that new, that new perspective, that new outlook, that new behavioral pattern and the the new way of choosing to perceive things. Now, as a mother, my journey of becoming a mother was, was the practice of surrendering and reparenting myself. And then becoming a mother was probably the biggest uh, rock, was the biggest awakening. I was going to say rock bottom, but it was the biggest awakening for me. Why, the reason I use the word rock bottom is I, I really suffered with postpartum depression, suicidal. <laughs> postpartum depression. Really. And that's so interesting because that's the thing you wouldn't plan. You'd think, wow, I've wanted this baby for so long and I'm so excited and here he is and it would be the most joyous time of your life. <clears throat> Yet you had suicidal postnatal depression. Yeah. Could you talk about that? Because obviously yeah. that must have been a real, what we call a spanner in the works. You definitely weren't expecting that. I wasn't, but it was the greatest gift and I'll tell you why. The, the, It took me about, well, I only started to see the big symptoms about three months into my postpartum experience, which is rare. Usually it's in the first six weeks. So, but it can happen anytime. And I have to say that out loud, loud and clear. Then uh, it started with insomnia, panic attacks, anxiety, agoraphobia, and then it led to the depression. The biggest issue was that I didn't get a diagnosis soon enough because of a lot of the stigma around mental illness, stigma around uh, antidepressants. There was just, it wasn't even on my radar. There was no way that I was gonna go down that road. And I just carried on with all of the holistic methods of taking melatonin and taking extra vitamins and checking my thyroid and all of which is helpful, but I was having a biochemical condition. 
And so I really want to speak to that in this wellness space, because there is a time and space for medical intervention when you are having a biochemical condition, when you are in, in, you know, in search of uh, medical support, there is a time and place. And I think that as spiritual people, we have to really claim that God is also in the medication. God is also in the doctors. God is also in the psychiatrists. We can't just sort of uh, spiritually will our way through issues that are, that are chemical or hormonal or, 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 or physical in some ways. But at the same time, we can't just take a pill and we forget about it. We have to really address the underlying root causes of the condition. So thankfully for me, I was able to get on a medicated path, get back to a safety, a baseline of safety, and then do deeper work. I did really beautiful EMDR, somatic experiencing. I still do every week. I practice IFS therapy and just went really deep into my own recovery. And so that was my experience of learning through the process of becoming a parent and deepening. And and I really want to point out that while I can say I had suicidal depression, I now two and a half years later can look back and say, I wouldn't change a thing because it got me on the deepest healing path. This may seem a little odd question, but did you get any backlash for that? Because I find that when you're in our field of helping people, they think you're perfect, your life is perfect. And I know when I got cancer, people would say, well, how did you get cancer? I thought yeah. you were spiritual. And then when I had surgery, they go, well, why didn't you just heal yourself? I don't understand. You're supposed to be this person that could do all this healing. Why did you have surgery? In fact, you know, of course I did both. I, I had the cancer removed and then I, I healed myself really fast. I never, I didn't have to have chemo or anything like that, but it's weird when people kind of attack you for getting some postnatal depression, not having perfect kids. I think people think your life is perfect, your marriage is perfect, your body is perfect and your kids are perfect. When it's not, they... I mean, I had lots of support, of course, but a few people were really kind of weird about, well, you can't be authentic then if you had that. And especially if you had conventional treatment, you definitely can't be authentic. So I'd love to know if you had any of that backlash when you came forward to talk about the postnatal depression. Not at all. Oh, good. I, for two reasons. One, all throughout my career, I have been extremely transparent about my suffering. I, I've, I've opened up to my audiences from the beginning, from addiction to remembering childhood trauma, to the shame around sexual abuse, to all of the truth, the truth telling. And frankly, the truth telling is one of the greatest vehicles for helping others heal and, 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 and really get on a path of recovery because they don't feel alone in the shame of it. I do believe from a spiritual perspective that part of my life path was to have all of these difficult experiences in my life so that I could be a voice for what deep healing can look like, so that I could live to tell, so that I could speak with authenticity, so that I could teach with truth. I'm not saying that I, you know, I I do believe that our soul signs up for certain things. And uh, I know that 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 my uh, my soul said, let's learn resilience. Let's learn how to live in a resilient way so that you can teach resilience. Mm-hmm. And, and that to me really looks like deep work. And for I just I just submitted my ninth book today, which is kind of a beautiful moment. But my, that book is a whole book about my journey of through trauma recovery. And as I look back and I read and I reread the book this morning, I look back and I see all the stages of my recovery. None of them are an accident. Each stage was, has, has been a new development and a deeper threshold and another opportunity for greater healing, even the postpartum experience. So being able to look back and say, okay, all of that has been divinely guided really helps me stay grounded without any shame around what has happened in my life. But the reason that no one gave me any backlash, I'll tell you this, is because I shared from a place that was absent of shame. Because I spoke about my experience from a place of pride and a place of recovery. And I didn't speak too soon. Had I started speaking up about my childhood trauma too soon, it would have been hit with backlash and it would have probably re-traumatized people. Had I spoken up about the PPD too soon, 
it wouldn't have been helpful because it's all about the energy that I'm in as the as the rock and tour. How am I telling the story? Am I telling the story from a place of shame or am I telling the story from a place of power? And as I tell that story from a place of power, people out there could be like, she's crazy. Why is she on an SSRI to get better? But they won't challenge me because I am not challenging myself. I love that because a lot of people in our business do feel a tremendous sense of shame. It's like, oh God, I'm a therapist and my marriage is broken down or I'm a therapist and I can't get my kid to behave. And, and I love the fact that you felt no shame, no shame, no need to hide it, no need to apologize for it. Just this is what has happened. And well, I think- I worked through the shame. I want to be clear. There was shame, right? But it's like that, that shame, that shame took me four extra months to get on meds, right? That shame of listening to all the voices and really- uh, shaming myself for being in the wellness world and having this problem and all that. So that was present. But the reason I didn't get backlash is because by the time I was willing to speak up about it, I had cleared the shame. Yeah. So by the time you came forward, no shame and you could just own it and be absolutely fine and almost say, you know, I'm glad that happened. I mean, I had a period a long time ago now where I lost a baby, I broke up with a baby's father. And I'd never been depressed in my life. Oh, and I lost a job on television. So like it was like a domino effect. And I'd never, ever, ever had depression. But I think it was a lot to lose a relationship with the baby, my job. But I was actually almost glad I had that. I thought, oh, this is what depression is like. I seem to have lived a charmed life before then. I mean, yeah. it wasn't charmed per se. I came from a kind of an unhappy background with strange parenting. But I'd never really had depression and I thought, you know what? I can look people in the eye now and say, I know what exactly. it feels like to wake up and go, oh, I know what it's like where you just don't want to go shopping or do anything. You just want to lie on the couch and don't even want to eat anything. And sometimes you go through it and think, oh, I'm, that's good. I, I wouldn't not have that in my life because I can truly have empathy and identify and know. And that's when I wrote my book, Trying to Get Pregnant and Succeeding, because I'd lost a baby. And I thought, well, there's nothing I can do now except write a book for someone else so they won't lose a baby. But I'm, I'm really impressed. I love that part of you, that there's no, oh, let's pretend it's all okay or just keep that bit of myself secret. So, yeah, so tell me now about raising Oliver. What's that, what is that like? Because there's really no control when you're raising a two-and-a-half-year-old. No, but I have... Uh, I believe chosen a path of parenting that is a lot easier for, for me. Back to your point, there's a lot of comparison around parenting styles. So I want to be conscious of that right now. Um, but I've, I've been, I've become a student of Dan Siegel's work and I'm really uh, the no drama discipline and the whole brain child and really nurturing the child's emotions. Yeah. So present with his feelings. And I love, he has the four S's seen soothed, secure, and safe. Yeah. And if I'm consistent with my conscious awareness of seeing him, soothing him, creating a safe environment for him, he will feel secure. He will be resilient. He will have a very powerful relationship with his emotions. He will know that it's safe to feel his feelings. And that's the best I can do for him to create an environment and a container with which he can show up in this very crazy world that we live in with a, with a toolbox of resilience, a toolbox of really knowing how to touch into his emotions and move through them. Um, I'm also a student of um, somatic experiencing. And so I really apply a lot of the SE work with my son, just in terms of helping with his physicality and moving things and yeah. really not letting him get stuck in a in a fear state. So being very aware and conscious of his emotional condition and allowing him to work through his feelings is um, a lot, obviously a lot easier for him. It's a lot easier for me because there's so much less resistance as a parent. You don't have to change the, t the tantrum. You can celebrate their true expression of their feelings. Just expressing himself. And I know when I was raising my daughter with other parents who had very different styles, and they go, why is your daughter so bad? I'm like, she's not bad. She's acting age appropriate. She's two and a half. So she's like 
getting dirty. She doesn't want to eat and she wants to run around. And I call her to stop because we're running and she doesn't stop. But that's age appropriate behavior. And I'd, always, I'd never say to her, why did you do that? I say, what happened to you? I remember years ago, I took her lambing with my nephew and they were both saying on a haystack, we were feeding lambs. And she pushed my nephew off the haystack. And I'm like, what happened to me? She said, mommy, you just said he was your favorite. I said, no, I said he was my favorite nephew. Wow. My favorite favorite. But instead of saying you're so bad, how could you do that? Right. Just reinforce the shame that was already placed on un- un- when you yeah. get zacked out, the best thing you do is go, hey, come here. This, this is not you. You're a great kid. Why did you just do mm-hmm. that to your cousin? And then say, well, you said you liked him more. Mm-hmm. You were nicer to him. You prefer him to me. And then you get to understand. And it's such a good idea to go, what happened to you to make you do that? You're a great kid. I say to my daughter all the time, look, you're a good kid and you're a smart kid. But good kids do bad things. And smart kids do silly things. I always say to her, you will never, ever, ever get punished for telling the truth. She goes, mommy, I've just got green nail varnish all over the carpet. Mm -hmm. I go, well, I'm I'm glad you told me that. And that's not great, but I could never punish her. And I was so glad because she would come home and tell me stuff that her friends would never tell their parents. I always said, if you tell me the truth, you will never, ever, ever get into trouble. Because I've seen so many clients who I never told my parents I was pregnant. I never told them I was molested. I never told them I was bullied. And that's such a shame because the biggest thing you want from your kids is honesty. And yeah. because all of us, you say, feel seen, soothed, secure, safe. He has no reason to be anything but honest with you. And that's such a great thing to share. That's my prayer. My prayer is that he will feel such a great sense of security in his relationship to myself and my husband and has and he's established such strong secure attachment bonds with us that he can have those tools to speak up when he needs to and to tell us what's what he's feeling and to really feel respected and, you know i i always say to him i love your big feelings i love your big feelings and it's I mean, for in my opinion, I think it's just the most important thing we can give a child. Yeah, I remember years ago, I was, I used to always say to my daughter, you know, you're not your behavior. And that mm-hmm. was very important to tell her, you know, you did something naughty or bad, but, but you're not your behavior. That's, you did, you're a good kid that did something bad. Like you just dropped juice all over the floor or you've got marker pen all over mommy's sofa. That's a bad thing but you're still a good kid. And I went to pick her up from school one day and she was only five and her teacher went, oh my God, I've just been put in my place by a fiver. Because I said to her, Phaedra, your mother is hopeless. She went, my mom isn't hopeless. She's just late. You're not your behavior, you know. Oh girl. (laughs) Beautiful. But that's when you give them the power to see the difference between their behavior and who they are. And they know they have a bad day. They're cranky. My little sister said, Mommy, are you having your pyramid today? Because you're very cranky. Pyramid. <laughs> I, I would say, you know, and that's another great thing as a parent, apologize to your kids. I had a bad day today. Mommy wasn't right. present. Mommy lost it a bit today. And if you explain it to them, they're, they're much more honest because they have bad days too. But I must ask you another question, which I'm really fascinated by, about where did you find the confidence and the conviction to pursue your message, to be a speaker? Where, where did you begin that? Where did you get the confidence from to, to write and to share your message at such a very young age? It's interesting. Remember I mentioned that I was uh, 14 and leading the spiritual youth groups. There was always this innate but even then, what, what had you at 14? Because you, you said that leading, you were a leader, even at 14. <clears throat> where did that come from? I think we're born with those innate qualities. I think that, that some of them are, are established as a result of our upbringing and what we've witnessed and, and how we've been brought up. But also just the, the, these qualities, I believe, are qualities that we are brought into the world with. And we uh, often, they can become medicine in a way. For me, I, uh, when I get on stage or when I write, I refer to myself as an untethered force of light. Being in that untethered state is the closest I get to source. It's the closest I get to God or in IFS therapy, uh, internal family systems, the closest I get to self. And so when I 
struggled throughout my life to be vulnerable in intimate relationships, it felt so easy and free to be vulnerable in front of thousands of strangers. So it's, it's, it's a strange thing, but there, for me, it, it, being on stage, being in the truth, being a full expression of personal growth and spiritual faith has always been like medicine for me. It's always been a place where I have felt the closest to that source of inspiration. I do believe that it is part of my soul's contract to come here to do that work. There's this beautiful quote, this Joan of Arc quote, I am not afraid I was born to do this. That is my mantra as a speaker and as a writer. I, I, I know that I am a channel to express spiritual truth, express loving truth, to be a conduit through which transformational messages come through. I know that. I believe I've known that since I was very young and I have committed to that fully and completely. And as a result, I've borrowed the benefits from allowing that source of inspiration to come through me on my podcast or on stage or through a book heals me. It heals me too. So it's a tremendous blessing to really allow your gifts to also be a gift to others because you not only are giving and supporting others through the work or the, or the passion projects that you allow, but you're also receiving so much healing at the same time. Yeah, I do believe it's a gift too. And I think it's a great gift that you were so open about the abuse in your childhood and could share that. Can you tell me what led you to decide to really be open and share that with people? With regard to my childhood childhood trauma? Yeah. Well, I didn't remember having experienced uh, adverse childhood trauma experiences until I was 36 years old. My body remembered, my reactivity remembered, but I didn't consciously remember. I had dissociated from the memory because it happened very young, because it, because it was uh, too painful to, to remember, truly. Really. Cool. So, uh, and I think, I thank my brain for having the ability to do that for the time that it did, because it kept me safe. And, 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 and then when I became safe enough in my, in my own personal relationships, in my therapy, that's when the memory was revealed. Uh, it took me a while before I could speak out about that. In fact, I write about this in my new book. I, there was moments where I did start to speak out about it a little bit too soon. And speaking prematurely on stages about, about my experience was still triggering for me and therefore triggering for my audiences. And thankfully I was able to, uh, thankfully it didn't cause too much harm, but I'm glad that I stopped that in its tracks because, and I knew that I was gonna one day write about it. I knew that I was gonna be speaking about it, but I wanted to make sure that it wasn't gonna be until I was fully ready. And thankfully I've had these opportunities to be on podcasts like this and with our friend Lewis Howes and other folks that have had these platforms where I've been able to share those experiences of, 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 of remembering a childhood traumatic event because it's a, in the sharing of it, it's a help, it's, it's really re releasing the shame and the stigma because it's just saying, it's normalizing these experiences and saying, yes, I've been there with you. And it allows people to raise their hand and say, me too. But I wasn't going to be able to write the book about it until I was fully safe enough to do so. Here's a question, because a lot of people in your position, I was just reading a book by someone I know recently about his trauma with his father, and he said his brother and sister now won't speak to him because they feel that he's um, invaded their privacy by describing so honestly his really traumatic childhood. But... A lot of people, it's not so much the, the, the friends and the audience, it's the people in the past, my father, mother, and aunts, uncles, brothers and sisters. So how did you deal with that? Well, I think that there's definitely been some resistance within the, the dialogue around this, because even if it's not directly associated with a family member, there's still shame because- oh. You know, no parent wants to say, oh, that happened to my child. Yeah, and I just never really hear yeah. their sister talk about these things, right? Uh, so so I've, I've been, you know, very verbal with my family about the things that I'm going to say and the things that I won't say. And the truth is, is that when it comes to speaking up about trauma, for me, it's felt that the details aren't going to help people 
but the the recovery path is what will the truth will but yeah. i haven't felt the need to like you know overemphasize details or because a lot of that can also be very triggering oh, you know, yes. I, and i found that even when i was at times speaking about addiction recovery you know i wasn't going to say like here i am like you know snorting cocaine off the floor you know what i mean like that's going to trigger whoever's listening right now but i could say yeah i struggled with cocaine addiction you know like there's two different ways to speak about something that cool. could be you know, activating to the listener, sorry to any addicts out there that might've been activated by what I just said, but, or, or, you know, just speaking very bluntly, very authentically about something that is a common condition that must be spoken about in order for the shame to lift and for the victim's voices to be heard. Yeah. And of course your story has probably inspired so many people who went, well, I was there. And if you can do it, I can do it. And that's the whole point. You know, we're, we're all the same. We share the same stories, the same problems, the same issues. And I believe that our greatest pain comes from the lies we tell ourselves. And so it's great that you're here sharing your story and saying it doesn't matter where you came from, where you were. It only matters that everyone has the power to change and live a life of phenomenal potential. But you have to kind of make peace with the past, feel really good about the present and really excited about the future too. So talking about the past and the present, when have you most needed to master your mindset? When in your life? Because you've been through a lot. When would you say is, have you really needed to master your mindset, the skills you now possess the very most? I have a strange answer for this. I think it's it's been every day, regardless. I think that that all the different experiences I've had throughout my life were opportunities to strengthen the mastering of my mindset. Mm -hmm. Where did I need it most? I think that I think that we need it most daily. I think it's a daily conditioning. I today feel the most settled I ever have in this new way of thinking, leaning more into the positive, being, being a optimistic woman, being a solution oriented person, a spiritually inclined person that is very natural to me today, but only because I made every day before it a commitment to get there. So it wasn't just this one period of time where I needed it most. I always needed it most to get to the place where it actually would, could really sink in. And here it is. What would you say the things that have helped you the very most? Of, I mean, I know there's a lot, but what things really helped you that you still practice on a regular basis? And what were your kind of aha moments about what worked for you and, and really helped you to change? What has helped me, particularly with the trauma recovery, has been EMDR, mm -hmm. movement desensitization, which is excellent. Uh, do you practice EMDR with your patients? No, no, I don't. But I really like it. I've seen. I, I have a few people who do um, PTSD. Well, some of some of the I've trained ten thousand people, and some of our graduates specialize in PTSD, and they do use it because it's so good for that. So helpful. Uh, I also practice and teach EFT emotional freedom technique, which is wonderful because you, you can learn how to develop that for yourself. It's a practice you can do at home, uh, similar to EMDR. Uh, somatic experiencing was really powerful for me because when you experience trauma, you become disembodied. You literally leave your yeah, body. Associated. So you dissociate. And so I lived for many years without what, what uh, SE refers to as the felt sense. I was just so unable to be present and to really truly feel into my sensations. And so through SE, I was I really <laughs> was brought back to life. Like I was, it was almost like I was brought back online, like rebooted, you turn the computer mm -hmm. off and on. Uh, and then uh, hypnosis, just, you know, I've, I've, I've followed a lot of your hypnosis. I worked with a woman um, called Melissa Tears. How funny is that? <laughs> Another hypnosis yeah. teacher. Um, and she really helped me tremendously with hypnosis. And uh, I think I think I would also really say that the biggest, uh, most life-altering practice that I have uh, experienced in my own therapy for nearly a decade, and now I'm becoming a student of through the level one training, is IFS therapy, which is founded by Dick Schwartz, and it's called Internal Family Systems. Oh, yes, and about that, yeah. 
But um, but IFS is just it, we could do a whole podcast on IFS and the simply put, it's really about recognizing that all of these different parts of us are are are, are present. That that when we have triggers and when we have reactivity, that those are parts of us that are protecting younger exiled parts. Is that the same as family constellations or is it different? No, no. Um, internal family systems is frankly a beautiful therapeutic practice that is taught in many therapy sessions with, without the patient realizing it's maybe even happening um, because the therapist is parts trained and they're using the work. But it's something that in my work, I hope to really demystify and help bring into the modern day lexicon in a different way. Because for me, I see it as a very spiritual practice. It's about recognizing that we have, we're not just one mono human. We have all these different parts of who we are and some parts are protecting younger parts. And when we start to connect to self, which you could talk about as like the Buddha nature or God within you or, or your inspiration, your spiritual connection, when we connect to that, that resourced part of ourself, we can learn to rely on that part to help bring all those other fear-based protector parts to less of a burdened state to get them out of their extreme roles. And it's, 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 it's very similar to what we've been talking about as it relates to uh, really tapping into a new way of seeing the world, tapping into a new way of thinking and leaning into that loving mindset, that resourced mindset, that, that, that internal leader, the voice of love within us. It's a lot, but it's, it, but it's, it's profound. And it, and it, and when it clicks in, you're totally new, you become a completely different person. <laughs> Something else I'd love to ask you because you've written nine books, which is I've written six, but nine is really impressive. Which books would you say have really helped you? I mean, I love um, the Body Keeps Score. Score. Have you read, I'm sure you've read that book about trauma. Yeah. It's such yeah. a great book. But which, if you had to recommend a few books right now to really help with trauma in particular, what would you say are your favorites? Well, I think that anyone who's experienced trauma should read Bessel van der Kolk's book, The Body Keeps the Score. You're absolutely right. It's tremendous. And what it did for me was it really helped me recognize how I was so not alone. When you hear the stories of so many other victims, you're like, whoa, that's me, that's me, that's me. Uh, any book by Peter Levine, uh, somatic experiencing books are extraordinarily helpful. Awakening the Tiger is one of them. Uh, I've found that even the parenting books, the, the Dan Siegel work, books like No Drama Discipline and The Whole Brain Child have actually really helped me reparent myself. Yeah, exactly. So you were talking about, if you just pick up from the parenting books, helped you to parent yourself. Yeah. The reparenting books really uh, gave me a new way of recognizing how not only I, what I want to treat my child, but how I can start to treat myself and reparent myself. So uh, I, I, and that's, that's actually most of what's next to my bedside these days is these, these Dan Siegel parenting books, uh, which have been very beneficial for me. Well, I really believe that it's never, ever too late to have a happy childhood. It's never too late to, you know, if you didn't, when I had my daughter, I bought so many Barbies because I wasn't allowed a Barbie and all the things I didn't have, I got to do through her. And I always think it's never too late to have a second childhood and indeed a happy childhood. Mm -hmm. so, I love it. Yeah. And um, it's so important to really, that's the great thing about being a parent. If you're lucky enough to have the time and the space, you know, at work for 12 hours a day, you can really engage with your kid and almost get to be a kid all over again. And it heals so many of your wounds. I found that I got to play and be, and I just love that, that having a child gives you the chance to be a child, well, no, that's not true because you're so busy cooking and cleaning and washing and nurturing. But I think when you get down to the playing, you, you really get your chance. And all my little girl storybooks, oh, I love them. I was in there with her. I, so we were driving back in the car once. I was listening to Jacqueline Wilson. She's a very amazing English children's writer. And I had to sit in the car until the story ended because it was so good. I'm like, oh, no, I can't go in the house. I've got, I've got to finish this. So yeah. Beautiful. I love that. So 
Tell me your three tips for mastering your mind. I, probably, I know you have so many, but if you had to narrow down, just that we just narrowed down the books, your three top tips for mastering your mind, what would they be? So uh, the first one is to witness your negative thoughts without any judgment. The second one is choose again. So reach for the next best feeling thought. Oh, I love that. Choose again. Yeah. And then I would say the third one is, is to establish a, any form of meditative practice, because when we begin to develop a meditation practice, we actually learn how to self-soothe. We learn how to calm an anxious mind <clears throat> and calm our nervous system. And so when we're in a less activated place, it's much easier to connect to that source within ourselves, that, that, that loving voice within us. Why do you think we are so prone to stress and burnout and exhaustion? You know, obviously we need meditation and breath work or hypnosis or anything that you can do to be calm and get into state. But why do you think we get into the state that, take, that makes us need to get into this better state? Why do you think we're so prone to stress, to burnout, to exhaustion, to always doing? I think that all the doing is a way of avoiding feeling. It's a, it's a form of uh, false protection against di difficult, uh, exiled, very painful parts that we have not wanted to allow ourselves to face. So we do, 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 so we don't have to feel, feel, feel. And when we start to face those deeper wounds and we start to unpack them through podcasts like this and therapeutic practices and books and, and, and healers and the support that is always available to us, when we start to unpack it and heal it, then we can start to do less and attract more as we started off with. Yeah, it's that thing about I'm just so busy doing, doing, doing that I never get a chance to feel. And I said that to my clients, look, you know, your feelings are the most real thing you have. You've got to feel a feeling until it no longer requires to be felt. You can't Netflix it or right. eat it or drink it or medicate it or shop it. You can try, but the feeling just regroups and comes back. And it is interesting that society is so busy doing I mean, I, I meet people and they have their television on all the time and that because they don't want to be alone with their thoughts because they don't like their thoughts and they haven't learned that if you don't like your thoughts, you can change them because your thoughts are yours to change. So you said something I really like. You said choose again, that your second mm -hmm. tip to master your mind would be choose again. So I'd love to conclude this talk. I'll talk to you all day. I'd love to conclude because that even the expression choose again is very beautiful. Tell me what that means to you and what that should mean to the audience, choose again. I actually have a method called the choose again method, which is in my book, Super Attractor. It's designed to help you really proactively reach for a better thought. So the first step is to notice the negative thought and how it makes you feel. The second step is to forgive yourself for having that thought. Because often when we have a thought that we keep thinking, Abraham Hicks says it beautifully, a belief is just a thought you keep thinking. So if you have that thought on repeat, you start to believe it's who you are. But when you forgive yourself for having that thought, you no longer have to see it as who you are. You can say, oh, that's actually just a thought I'm thinking. It's not me. So, yeah. so that's that step. second step. Forgive yourself. Oh, there it is again, that funky thought. Okay. And then the third step is to choose the next best feeling thought to choose again. And so, for instance, if the thought is, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in debt, I'm broke, you can notice how it makes you feel. Notice the thought. Forgive yourself for having the thought. It's a thought I keep thinking. And then choosing again. Well, I have great resources now with the internet. There are so many creative possibilities. I have that free training I found online about manifesting abundance. I'm not afraid to work hard. I've got a resume that I can send out. And you just reach and reach and reach and reach. And before you know it, you're no longer in despair and self-deprecation. And you're now in this different mindset that has possibility. And so you have the power to choose again. 
So why do you think people feel that they're not enough? I mean, my whole flagship um, program is, and I created the I'm Enough movement because I saw over 30 years that almost all my clients, whether they were billionaires who had everything or somebody who was just having a little startup bakery, they all had the same belief, I'm not enough. So in your own experience, you've had a very different life to mine, but where do you think that comes from, the not enoughness? All of that. De- is developed as a uh, early childhood experience. It's the uh, without the proper attachment bonds, without the proper methods for experiencing our emotions and processing them fully, and being able to really care care for ourselves when we aren't being cared for. We don't have that. That's not the playbook that most parents were handed, and so children unfortunately pick up a lot of unconscious shame and a lot of unconscious beliefs whether they've had the most beautiful childhood or not. And those belief systems can become core wounds that can dictate the way that we are throughout our life. But the beautiful thing is that anyone listening to this podcast right now is clearly on a path of personal growth and development. And through the practices of spiritual practice, through the practices of therapeutic practices, self-help books like the ones that we've we've written and shared and, and therapeutic books like yours, these types of practices not only have the power to change us from a spiritual perspective and change and undo those beliefs, but they also change our brain because of neuroplasticity, because of our ability to, the brain's ability to change. So we may have developed these belief systems. They may be strong, but as anyone who is on a spiritual and personal growth path, our work is to be in the devotional commitment of undoing those belief systems and reclaiming that we are good enough. So where can we find you? Where can we find you and your other eight amazing books? Everything can be found at DearGabby.com. You can find me on my podcast, Dear Gabby, which is uh, anywhere you get your podcasts. And I'm at, at Gabby Bernstein on Instagram. Wonderful. Gabby, it's been an honor and a pleasure and such a joy to talk to you. Check out my next video here. Anyone notice that as that day comes around, they're sick? Because here's how the mind works. You say, oh my God, I volunteered to chair that meeting. I must have been out of my mind. I'd die if I've got to go on stage. I don't want to do that. And your brain's like, leave that with me. Now next Wednesday.